of a small dinosaur of this general kind. Without those feather impressions, it would have been impossible to actually say that this was a bird. Because if you look simply at the skeleton of this creature, the skeleton is that pretty typically of a little carnivorous dinosaur. The bird dinosaur nature of Archaeopteryx prompts other questions. Could it fly like a bird? The main feature which distinguishes Archaeopteryx from other dinosaurs is that it's got feathers. And we think they acted aerodynamically. Now, if you look at the feather of a modern bird, like this swan, and compare it with the feather of Archaeopteryx, you see exactly the same structure. The central shaft with veins radiating off it. What's most important, the shaft doesn't run down the middle of the feather, it runs slightly off to the side. And that means the feather aerodynamically is optimally designed. There's no reason for Archaeopteryx to have a feather like that, unless it flew. I wouldn't want to say Archaeopteryx is definitely an ancestor of all modern birds, but it is the closest specimen we've got to that lineage. I like to think of it as a, almost a snapshot in time, of course, uh, evolutionary change in, in the act of changing. Evolution caught in the act? Archaeopteryx has is, is got to be the nearest we've got to what is effectively an evolutionary missing link. It's lying very, very close to the borderline between what is effectively a true dinosaur and what is perhaps one of the earliest known birds. Archaeopteryx is the nearest we'll ever get to catching evolution in the act. The link between dinosaurs and birds, first established in Germany and developed by men like John Ostrom and Peter Vaunhofer, is worth celebrating. Dinosaur detectives don't find missing links every day. But as they toast, other investigators are proposing even more radical ideas. In America, some now suggest that the most fearsome meat eater of all time, T. rex, is closely related to a bird. Bob, where do you stand on this bird-dinosaur link controversy? Well, I stand with Thomas Henry Huxley, who in 1868 said that birds are the direct descendants of dinosaurs. What he pointed out, still true today, you look at a meat-eating dinosaur, like Tyrannosaurus rex, and the hind foot looks like a bird. It's got three toes that face forwards, a little toe in the back, short torso, curved neck, uh, short but strong front legs. The overall gestalt is like a bird. But now we have a lot more evidence. If you look at a bird head, this is an ostrich, and it's the eye socket there, and look at how the... Um, jaw attaches to the head. Well, it attaches right there. And there's a, a pair of grooves that are, that are oblique. They go inwards and forwards. And the lower jaw slides when an ostrich bites. Slides. There's only one type of prehistoric animal that has a sliding jaw joint like that. Only one. That's the big meat-eating dinosaurs. Okay. So there's a detailed mechanical resemblance between a dinosaur and a bird. This gigantic jaw could slide backwards and forwards just like a four-foot-long ostrich jaw. But the thing I really love is most people think of birds as delicate and Tyrannosaurus rex is rather big and crude. It's not true. Tyrannosaurus rex is incredibly closely related to birds. There's a the T-Rex head. Giant. Five feet long and it looks massive. It looks real solid. But it's not. It's hollowed out. Nearly every bone of a Tyrannosaurus rex skull was penetrated by air ducts connecting to the lungs, exactly as in a bird skull, exactly. Down to fine details of where the nerves and blood vessels go, and these air ducts, Tyrannosaurus rex is a bird head. It's a bird brain and an air head. You take your ostrich, get a chicken, maybe you're a pigeon, Cut the skull away, and you'll see a ductwork just like that. Mm. So whether you're talking about overall resemblance or detailed plumbing, birds are dinosaurs, and your parakeet is a close cousin of Tyrannosaurus rex? Well, now, now in the detective work, to get to this theory, which sounds 
perfectly plausible to me, but to get to that from the middle of the 19th century, what's new? What, what has been added in the number of clues that bring you to the conclusion now that seems so definite? Well, by 1870, they knew that some sort of dinosaur was the direct ancestor of birds. They really had a good case. They also knew it was probably a meat-eating dinosaur. But they didn't know which of the many meat-eating dinosaurs was closest to birds. What we've added in the last couple of years is it's the very advanced, air-conditioned meat-eaters, like Tyrannosaurus or the little Troodon. Those are the guys who are very, very, very close. We've good. So, so really, in all these years that we've been talking about the extinct dinosaur, right. we've just been wrong. That's right. Dinosaurs aren't extinct. You can think of Tyrannosaurus rex as the 8,000-pound roadrunner from hell. <laughs> While meat-eating dinosaurs have their own evolutionary tales to tell, so too do the plant eaters. Living alongside Archaeopteryx, there were the giant dinosaurs like Diplodocus and Brachiosaurus. These were the first creatures ever to feed upon tall trees. To do this, they had to evolve extremely long necks. This creature was able to reach very, very high up into the trees. The trees that grew at this time were primarily conifers. They were very tall, and most of the vegetation was clustered near the top. So this was an ideal way of reaching giraffe-like right up into the trees to actually crop the vegetation. It has very large peg-like teeth, which would have been ideal for scraping or nipping off small branches. It could be a very effective hoover up of all the rubbish in the environment, in a sense. All the relatively indigestible twigs and pine cones and leaves and needles. They have a very complex digestive system. The stomach would be a large, muscular sac, lined, in this case, with large, rounded, polished pebbles. These would be acting like a mill to pummel up the plant food. The teeth weren't designed to chew up the food, so it uses stones in its stomach instead. Once it's reduced the plant food to a mushy pulp, it's then passed on to another part of the digestive system, the back end, and here there are like long cavernous tubes, and this mushy plant material passes into those tubes where it's mixed up with the bacteria, which then break down and produce the chemicals that allow the animal to live. Against these giant feeding machines, the plants fought back. From their struggle to survive, a more varied and beautiful environment began to emerge. Any large herbivore has a tremendous effect on the vegetation that it eats, and to tear down trees, to uh, remove large branches and that sort of thing. Um, that has an effect on the vegetation, it has an effect on individual trees, and it also opens clearings in the forest, and elephants act in that way even today. Um, large trees um, may, in a sense, not have any choice but to defend uh, what they are, and so they would develop mechanisms of defense, for instance, um, spines or uh, sharp pointed leaves, or perhaps uh, chemical toxins that would, that would uh, deter those big herbivores. But if you're a small plant, a weedy thing that um, doesn't have a very big body to begin with, it may be that it's much easier, rather than to try to defend that, to, to begin to grow very rapidly, to get through a life cycle quickly before you're eaten. So I think the first flowering plants may have fallen very naturally into a a defense mechanism that wasn't so much a defense as it was an escape from, from herbivores, from the big dinosaurs that, that uh, were, were after them. The next wave of big plant eaters had short necks, fed close to the ground. One thing flowering plants do, better than any other type of plant, is they can spread rapidly and regenerate themselves after heavy grazing. Near the end of the dinosaur's reign lived centrosaurs in large herds. Thousands roamed the plains in search of food. Weighing three tons with sharp beaks and great powerful jaws, they wreaked havoc. Plants had only one defense, to blossom in profusion to survive. And flowers just explode across the landscape. It's an incredible, the biggest event in, in plant evolution are the flowers coming in and people have asked why. 